The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right. Well, I'd like to thank uh, thank you for inviting me again to, to talk to the poker class. It's always great to, to, to come here. And, you know, we're going to be having a tournament in a couple of weeks. So good luck for the people participating in that. Actually, I'm coming back in another two weeks uh, because I think this is like a Harvard MIT math tournament for. <laughs> high school kids. So, you know, I, I really love visiting MIT. I just wish we were at some other time besides the winter. <laughs> um, like, then it would be perfect. All right, today I'm going to talk about uh, the University of Alberta's Cepheus uh, uh, computer program that supposedly saw poker. We're going to talk about what they actually did. <laughs> there seems to be a lot of buzz about this, so I, I thought this was a uh, uh, good to do. Um, so I, I have to tell you that Jared and I uh, did not work directly with uh, the University of Alberta uh, people, but we're very familiar with their methods and have uh, actually, you know, tried some of their coding techniques. So we're pretty familiar with uh, say the research that's going on. It's sort of a, I think, an objective commentary. <laughs> so, by the way, uh, as the lecture goes on, you can interrupt and ask questions, just raise your hands if, if something's unclear or not. Because I've been told I have about 80 minutes. I'm going to try to spend like 55 and then save the rest for questions. All right. So the outline of my talk, first I'm going to talk about what Cepheus accomplished, what the University of Alberta people accomplished. And I'm going to sort of uh, bring that up by discussing Game theory optimal strategies in poker. How many of you know what game theory optimal is? I just want to know, or what a Nash equilibrium is. Raise your hands. Uh, okay, uh, so about half, two thirds. Good. I'm gonna do a quick introduction to you know what game theory optimal is. We're gonna talk about like a simple poker game and solutions to it. Um, and then I'm gonna go into their algorithm, which is uh, written. In Minimization. They use the uh, method of counterfactual. Actually, the method they use to push through to the solution to the problem is counter CF plus, which is um, basically the the original algorithm. With some shortcuts, which we'll discuss. Um, after this, uh, though, we we're going to think about extensions of computer solutions to other games, including. Big bet games and multiplayer games. Uh, a couple of people have questions about Snowy No Limit program. Uh, we'll talk about what uh, their work entailed if, if, if uh, the questions lead in kind of that direction. Um, all right. So let's talk about what Cepheus accomplished. It's a game theory optimal solution to heads up limit hold. And so, what does that mean? You guys all know what. Limit Hold'em is, right? Good. Um, basically, it's uh, it, after 900 PU years, they've achieved an exploitability of less than one one thousandth of a big blind. So the first thing is not a like true, like perfect optimal solution. There, you can still exploit it for about one one thousandth of a blind per, per hand. Um, however, they're probably better games. <laughs> this is like one twentieth. This is one two thousandth big bet. You can actually play heads up for fifty years at, at normal speed and still have some probability of losing. <laughs> With, uh, the reason for that is kind of the uh, standard deviation of of heads up limit hold'em is about five big blinds. So you can just imagine how many hands you have to play to have statistical significance. About you know, 25 million each. <laughs> so 
Uh, so it's definitely a milestone. This is the first time like a real poker game has been solved. Like in the math of poker, we solved ace, king, queen game, you know, on paper. But it's the first time like a real poker game's been solved. Uh, however, given their previous work, it was just a matter of time. Like I remember two or three years ago, they passed the one one hundredth of a big bet, um, which is sort of our measure of significance. So if you're playing and you're winning kind of more than one one hundredth of a big bet per hand, you can kind of think it's a profitable game. Below that comes just sort of theoretical. So it's definitely a milestone. And uh, basically, I knew that if they just maybe spent more CPU power, they would get the solution. After 900 CPU years, they finally got the solution. Um, so, I don't know. If I had that much CPU power, I'd <laughs> solve a few problems too. <laughs> but, you know, uh, but it's still, it, it, it's still a milestone. It's, it's, it, it's great. So what effect does this have on other games? Uh, does this mean that poker is going to kind of go the way of chess where computers are just much better than we are? I don't think we're there yet, and we'll, we'll talk about that uh, later. So let's talk about Nash equilibrium. Um, so John F. Nash won the Nobel Prize in 1994 for pioneering analysis of equilibria and the theory of non-cooperative games. And he extended the work of John von Neumann and Oscar Morgenstern, who actually first considered these two-player zero-sum games. So Nash equilibrium is just a set of strategies such that no player can actually improve its, their, their strategy and kind of make more money. Util, whatever. In the two two player zero sum games, we refer to Nash equilibria as also very optimal. The reason is because Nash equilibria are also the min max solution. It's the best you can do given that he can see what you do and respond. Um, a s simplest case of Nash equilibria is if you're playing rock, paper, scissors, what's the Nash equilibrium? One third each. So, um, that's not that exciting in this case because uh, both players kind of just guarantee zero. You can't make more than zero, you can't make less than zero. So it doesn't seem to be that exciting a, a solution. But in poker, it's kind of exciting because uh, there are kind of dominated mistakes people play or mistakes that actually lose money to, to, to the, the optimal solution. So the reason... Uh, one third, one third is an Nash equilibrium because nobody can do anything to improve kind of their lot. It may not be the best thing to play. If a guy's playing one half scissors and one half rock, what should you play? 100% rock. <laughs> yeah, sort of like the Aerosmith strategy. But, <laughs> um, right. So there are much better ways to play if your opponents deviate from natural color brim. So actually game theory optimal is not necessarily the best way to play uh, even heads up. It's a way to play to kind of guarantee you never lose money. So that's sort of the accomplishment. Uh, that's why kind of heads up we like to find these solutions because I know I can just play this and I'm not taking uh, total advantage of my opponent's mistakes but at least I'm playing in a way where he can't take advantage of me at all. Um, Let's do a simple example. So this is uh, an example I'll, or that, that I shared with the class a couple of years ago. So there are two players, Rose and Colin. The reason the players are called Rose and Colin are because this refers to matrix games. You know, if you, <laughs> right. One, one player chooses a row, the other player chooses a column. That's their payoff. <laughs> and uh, for three-player games, we introduce Larry because they're layers, yeah. But so the two played with rows and columns. So each player ante is 50 for $100 in a pot. Rose looks at a card for full deck. She will win at the pot at showdown if the card is otherwise she will lose. So Rose can decide to bet $100 or check after she looks at her card. So there's $100 in the pot. She looks at her card, she decides whether to bet $100 or to check. If Rose bets, Colin may decide to call 100 or fold. If Colin folds, Rose wins. Well, you guys know how poker works, right? If Colin calls or show down, if the card's actually a spade, she wins the whole pot. Oh. 
Colin wins the pot. So what's the optimal strategies for Rose and Colin? Does anybody know the answer? Uh, well, let's, uh, let, let's do one side of it. How often do you think Colin should call? Colin wants to call just enough to make Rose's bluffs profitable. So Rose, if Rose gets a spade, what, she, what, what, what is she going to do? Bet. There's nothing to lose by betting. Unless she's being very, very tricky. <laughs> but uh, it is correct to bet. Um, so let's see. If Rose doesn't pick up a spade and bluffs, how often does that have to succeed for it to be profitable? Right, $100 in the pot. She looks at, if it's not a spade, she has to bet $100. And what's, what's how much uh, is she risking? How much is she? going to win. It's actually a hundred and another hundred, right? Because there's a hundred dollars in a pot. She, she, yeah, sure, she anteed uh, something to make the pot, but she's spending a hundred dollars and if Colin calls, she's going to lose a hundred dollars, right? If Colin folds, she's going to win the hundred in the pot, right? Where she could have just given up. So it's like one to one, so Rose should call half the time. And I mean, Colin should call half the time. Uh, Rose should bluff like uh, in a, bet to bluff in a two to one ratio because Colin, that's the odds Colin gets the call. So Rose should always bet a spade. If Colin calls 100% of the time, Rose will just never bluff. If Colin never calls, Rose will just bet every time. So there is uh, kind of no equilibrium there. If Colin calls half the time, Rose will be indifferent to bluffing. She will eat negative 50 either way without a spade and net 100 with a spade. Uh, this is the correct strategy for Colin. And the correct strategy for Rose is to uh, this ratio of bluff to spade is like one to two. So Rose should basically bet half of her hearts. She can bet the high hearts. And I guess with the eight of hearts, she can decide whether, is it the eight or the seven? Well, no, it's the, yeah, it's the eight. <laughs> <laughs> With the eight of hearts, you can decide whether to uh, bet or not, like half the time. So these are natural equilibriums and game theory optimal strategies. And basically, uh, the value of the game is negative, uh, is, is worth $12.50 to Colin. Um, any questions about this? Or? All right. So this, these are kind of the strategies that... Uh, that the algorithm kind of tries to find. Um, well, let's, let's go on to the algorithm now. Well, let's talk about what theory optimal is first. By the way, there'll be about five or so transparencies full of math equations. So just suffer through these, you know. Well, uh, those, those of you who understand are, are gonna like uh, enjoy the later part but uh, let's just talk formally about what game theory optimal means. So there's this uh, game function, u, which takes two strategies, an x strategy and a y strategy, uh, and it gives a value. If this was rock, paper, scissors, you know, you would have u of uh, rock versus scissors to be one, so on and so forth. You know, it's positive for x and negative. x is trying to <laughs> the, 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 um, uh, trying to uh, x gets you and y loses you, you know that's, that's the, sort of the idea. So one of the things is f f we can take convex linear combinations of strategies. That is, if uh, x sigma x k are strategies, and we have some uh, coefficients that are all non-negative and that sum to one, we can a new strategy is a linear combination of these strategies, and also u is bilinear, means that uh, the, the, the value of the game here is just the uh, kind of linear combination that uh, makes sigma x. And it would be the same also for sigma y. So what, I mean, this just means, suppose you have two strategies and you play one third uh, sigma x1, one third, and two thirds sigma x2, your payoff is going to be one third of the payoff of 
Sigma X1 and one third payoff of Sigma X2. Uh, pretty, hopefully that's uh, pretty clear. Uh, well, now we define a pair of strategies to be an epsilon equilibrium if the best X can do against Y's strategy, the best Y can do against X's strategy is epsilon. Uh, and if epsilon is equal to zero, these two are in kind of Nash equilibrium. So after 900 um, GPU hours, what they found were two strategies, sigma X star, sigma Y star, um, that were within uh, one, one thousandth of a big blind of uh, equilibrium. And that, that, that was, that's basically their accomplishment. Um, so I'm going to actually kind of go through the nitty gritty of how they did this in case you, you would like to write your own poker solver someday. Um, so the big, the, the big idea that they borrowed was this idea of regret minimization, which is actually pretty cool. Suppose that each time step t, the player has uh, a, a few pure strategies. Uh, we're assuming the player has like a handful of strategies. Like in poker, obviously, the, 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 there's like trillions of strategies, but two to the trillions of strategies. But say he has like two strategies. He can play one or two. Suppose his odds or evens or something like that. Or he has three strategies, like paper, scissors. Um, so basically, uh, he chooses some sort of mixture of strategies uh, at, at the beginning, and uh, we're only kind of dealing with one player at this time. We're assuming the other guy, we're assuming he's playing against some adversary that's kind of all-knowing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's the original setup of the regret minimization. We'll talk about how this applies to game theory uh, in general. Now at each time t, we're given values u, u t of sigma k. So basically, after he determines this, the adversary decides what the value of u sub t is. And basically, his payoff is just kind of the linear combination of the things he picked. The, the idea is that the adversary can be sort of adversarial. He, he can decide to, 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 to make uh, K, the, the, the Kth peer strategy score well some of the time, and the Kth peer strategy score badly some of the time. So basically, now the idea is to calculate a regret. We define, by the way, this is not the notation that's used in the uh, th three or four papers they wrote on this, because, I mean, I think they did great work, it's just that uh, it's not really written as a math paper. <laughs> It, it, it looks like a particle physics paper, you know, which is <laughs> actually, uh, for particle physics, it, you need all the complex uh, notation because they're trying to describe something pretty difficult. I think for computer science papers, you usually don't need this. But, uh, so l l I'll explain this and then you guys can reread their paper. And uh, I, I think this will give you like a, 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 a quicker way to understand and their paper. So there's this thing called regret of the kth option at time t, which is this the uh, sum of the difference of playing k versus playing whatever you played. So basically, you can have positive regret or negative regrets. Uh, negative regrets means that what you played, uh, what you decided to play up to time t was better than just playing k at each uh, time step. So uh, we're only concerned, we're mostly concerned with the positive regret, which means instead of playing, you should have played, you could have made more money by playing option K. Uh, so what's, what's the significance of this? Uh, so the idea is we want the average regret, which is uh, this, this, this element divided by T. So basically uh, you want the average regret average amount that you're kind of missing out on to be less than epsilon sub t, where an epsilon sub t is the sequence converging to zero. If you have this, the point, if, if, if you have this, you have some sort of regret minimization for them. So cool thing about it is uh, you can do regret matching. You can let these uh, weights, first of all, 
you just uh, look at the positive, the things with positive regret, and you weight the options at each turn. You basically weight the options that have positive regrets uh, accordingly. And if you're so lucky that nothing has positive regret, you just randomly pick a strategy. Um, let's kind of do an example because I think this is kind of unclear what it does. So let's just say we have two strategies. The player can pick one or the player can pick two at each time or the player can pick some mixture of one and two. Uh, after a player does that, the adversary comes out and says, well, one of them is worth zero and one of them is worth one. So let's just see how this kind of works. So suppose at the first time step we pick sigma 2 because we don't have any regrets yet. We're just randomly picking a strategy, sorry, sigma 1. We just randomly pick sigma 1. Uh, so the adversary now gives us uh, uh, the value of sigma 1 0 and sigma 2 is 1. And you go, oh, well, that means that the regret uh, of the first option is 0 and the regret of the second option is 1. The regret of the first option is 0 is because you already played sigma 1, so you can't have any regret, either positive or negative, for playing sigma 1 because you, you, your option was playing sigma 1. And, but you have some regret of like not playing sigma 2 because sigma 2 was, was kind of the winner here. If the two values were re reversed, we would have r1 equals 0 and r2 equals the negative 1. And then we'd be kind of happy because all our regrets were kind of non-negative. So at t equals 2, uh, because we have zero regret here and regret 1 here, uh, we actually pick the strategy to be all sigma 2. Uh, now the adversary says, OK, well, the value of sigma 1 is 1, and the value of sigma 2 is 0 for the second time step. So what happens? Well, the same thing happens before. Uh, now our, we have uh, regret of one on the first option and regret of one on the second option. So what, what, what do we do next? The regrets are the same. So guess. Well, flip a coin or just pick a linear uh, even combination of the two strategies. Half of one and half of the other. Like that, that's what we can do. The regrets are the same. So now the adversary says, Sigma 1 is 0 and sigma 2 is 1, uh, which means that uh, the regret of 1 actually goes to 0.5 and the regret of 2 actually goes to 1.5. One of them goes up by half, one goes down by half. So now with these regrets, um, our weighting is uh, kind of the ratio of the two. It's uh, 1 fourth sigma 1 and 3 fourths sigma 2. So now the adversary goes, OK, well, sigma 1 is 0 and sigma 2 is 1. Uh, so this, this regret actually goes by th down by 3 quarters, and this goes up by a quarter. And since this is negative, now we pick the strategy be sigma 2, like, and so forth. Now the adversary can offer us to say, oh, it's really sigma 1. Then a regret of sigma 1 would go up to 0.75, and so on and so forth. So it seems that the adversary can make uh, kind of the, the job tough on us. Well, actually, there is a theorem that says, it, for our example, there's a quadratic bound. The square of the first regret, if it's positive, plus the square of the second regret, if it's positive, is always going to be less than or equal to t. Um, and that's because if, if in the case where these are both positive, you have, uh, it, it, go through an example, you're really going R1 of T plus or minus whatever amount of R2 you're doing, and R2 of T now minus plus whatever amount of R1 you're doing. Uh, the thing is that when you square this, you can see the cross terms cancel each other out. This becomes like 2 R1 R2 divided by R1 plus R2 T. So you're left with this squared plus this squared plus this squared plus this squared. And this squared plus going to be less than 1, so we have this here, which means that the quadratic sum only increases at most by 1. We have this bound. Why is this bound so great? Well, if the square of the regrets are less than t, that means uh, the average regret is going to be less than 1 over root t. In fact, 
uh, it's kind of left as a homework problem. In a general case, our kt over t is less than n minus 1 delta over root t, where delta is kind of the maximum deviation of the options, n is kind of is the number of options. Yeah? I'm curious, um, is, is a mathematical object in, in terms of poker, what, what is a strategy sigma? Which is a number of like a payoff? No, no, no. A strategy sigma in, a, in terms of poker strategy is sort of a description of what you would do. Like, it, it, suppose you get uh, a6 offsuit preflop. Right. Uh, a, a strategy would be a descriptor of what you would do at each point of the hand. So, uh, what's, so, so there's some significance to the fact that this, uh, uh, this, this regret uh, kind of average regret goes to zero. Well, the significance in terms of uh, game theory optimal is uh, suppose the peer strategies are, suppose you have a, a bunch of peer strategies <coughs> for x and a bunch of peer strategies for y. If we regret match, but instead of doing an adversary, we just say the, the, the teeth uh, utility for x is just the utility uh, f for x playing against sigma of ty, and the utility for y is just negative, uh, the, utility, the game utility for, for y playing against sigma xt. This is kind of a mutual regret matching. You do regret matching for x and y at each step, which means you just modify x's, uh, you, you, you compute the regrets at each step, and then you modify x and y strategy by, by this type of regret matching. And uh, basically, the strategies that, you know, that you choose is the average strategy, which is the, the kind of the, the, the sum of the strategies you have had all along divided by t, like a 1 over t weight of all, all of the strategies you've done at each of these t steps. And uh, basically, what happens is now, if you try to figure out the exploitability of the strategy, again, this is the best x can do against y. And this minus the best y does against x. You compute this, and you add the sum of uh, what, what, what actually happened with x sub t and y sub t, and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, you notice that this is just uh, the regret of uh, k, uh, of x picking strategy k all the time. This is the regret of y picking strategy j all the time. So less, less than 2 epsilon over t, because regrets over t converge, so it's within 2 epsilon t of game theory optimal. Basically, what this all means is, uh, basically, suppose you choose your strategy, just some mixture of stuff. Your opponent like, tries to figure out uh, how best he can exploit this strategy. By the way, this is often called nemesis. I really like that name. <laughs> uh, Opponent figures out his nemesis strategy against you, and uh, then, well, you get to see. So his nemesis strategies, unless you're playing the exact game three optimal strategy, is always going to be better than the game value, right? He just looks at what you do, and finds the best response, and you can you do the same to him, and kind of the difference of those two games, kind of the exploitability, obviously. Uh, th th this means basically, if your opponent sees what you do, uh, what what you're doing, this is the best he can do against you. And uh, this th this number is the one that's less than one one thousandth of a big blind. So counterfactual regret is kind of cool because it's a good thing I've drawn kind of tree at each of your decision points. Now you can regret match. You, uh, so first of all, um, you don't need to be fed back the correct utility of the game. Like, uh, you, you know, here in the example we gave, we, we had a u0 and u1. You can just be fed back some unbiased stochastic number that averages be the value of the game. Like, for example, if you're doing regret matching on poker, like, it's hard to tell if, like, come up with this strategy that's a bunch of terabytes, and you come up with a strategy that's also a bunch of terabytes, like what the value you're playing against Y is. But we can just get a sample, right? We get a sample. 
Oh, right, well, you can just run once, right? <laughs> right, that's the idea. You can, you can get an unbiased sample by just saying, okay, just play one hand and see the result of that hand. Um, so, and you can use like either random chance or whatever every time you decide to do uh, one of the branches of your tree if you do a mixed tree. So the cool thing already is without counterfactual regret, um, you can quickly converge the solution because a lot of strategies, um, you know, like fictitious play, is the best response. The best response is hard to calculate sometimes, but uh, each sort of simulation can just be one iteration through it. And this is counterfactual regret because the weighting is given assuming that the player like does everything to play to that node. So the weighting here is, you know, nature just has its probabilities. Uh, if your opponent plays, you assume he plays according to his strategy. But when you play, you always kind of play towards that node. So your weight is actually one for each of these options you pick. Um, the, the cool thing is that once you have the structure set up uh, where you're just doing um, one or a few iterations throughout the hand, um, it's actually pretty easy to set up different weighting schemes. Um, for example, if you, if you have two options uh, and like the ace of hearts comes on the turn or the deuce of clubs comes on the turn and you don't really have to worry about the ace of hearts coming on the turn. That, that, that tree, that part of the tree is fine. That part of the tree has like very little like, positive regrets. You can say, okay, well, we'll just play a different game where the ace of hearts comes uh, about one of the time the deuce of clubs comes, but we're going to weight the results by 10. You still get the same answer. Uh, it's just that you get a much coarser kind of grid every time the ace of hearts comes, but you already kind of know what to do with that, and you can sort of work on the deuce of clubs. So there are a lot of these different weighting schemes. Uh, th 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 this means that the hands can be kind of sampled intrinsically. Um, so the final algorithm they have was fractal regret plus. Uh, so instead of having accumulate negative regrets, basically a lot of these regrets can be really negative. Like folding aces preflop quickly turns to really negative regret. <laughs> you, you, you lose your small blind and probably if you play it, limit hold'em, you can win more than a small blind. So. You accumulate a lot of negative, so, so that option like, sort of falls off the map. Uh, their innovation in counterfactual plus is to, instead of putting a big negative number to a lot of these things, they just floor them at zero. And the reason they floor at zero is because uh, you, you know this is uh, a simultaneous evolution of strategies where, you know, even uh, s strategies at the beginning this might not be great strategies, and you want to, if, if regret of something is zero, is zero it can re get the regret faster if it's the right thing to do to respond to your opponent's strategy. Um, a lot of these things, like suppose you, you, you start off with a random initial guess for your opponent's strategy. Then you actually have a pretty reasonable strategy, which you bet and raise every time with every if your opponent has a random strategy, he might just fold, right? So later in the streets, it's probably wrong to just bet and raise every time with every hand. He raises you back. It's not like he knows anything. It's a random strategy. Just raise him back and hope he folds. If he doesn't fold and call, you bet again in the next street because now the pot's bigger, right? So if he has a one-third chance of folding, <laughs> you should bet and So <coughs> that evolves quick. If you start off with a random tree with like no information, you, that starts off as <coughs> kind of the dominant strategy. And then you, you kind of have to walk that back as your opponent's strategy evolves also. By the way, uh, they're actually kind of keeping two trees, right? One for the small blind strategy, one for the big blind strategy. And this is everything with respect to the small blind, right? The small blind doesn't... So uh, let's just go to the next slide. We can probably, oh, we just have to be, wait, oh. okay. So let's try to figure out how 
big the, the, the strategy space in Limit Hold'em has to be. Uh, so let's con concentrate on river nodes because that's like most of the nodes, right? You know, it's a tree, so we, we just have to calculate the leaves. Um, so first of all, um, assuming a four bet cap, the reason we assume a four bet cap, well, I don't know why, but it seems that, uh, that that's, so, so this is one approximation to four bet cap, but this is kind of normal in these types of research papers. Um, if we have a four bet cap, there are nine possible actions that get you to the next street. There are some actions that don't to the next street, like player one bets and player two folds, but that if you don't get to the next street, you don't get to like the river, and that's a pretty small percentage of, of the nodes. So why are there nine possible actions? Uh, let's count them. One of the actions that gets you to the next street is check check, so that's one. Where are the eight? Where are the other eight? Right, 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 check, raise, yeah. let's try systemic, count them. So I claim that there are two ways to one bet in the pot, right? Player one can bet and player two can call. Or player one can check, player two can bet, and player one can call. In fact, there are two ways to put k bets in the pot if k is greater than zero. Like, if there are three ways, there, if you want to put three bets in the pot, where, where are the two ways? Right. Check. Yeah, right. Bet, raise, re-raise, call, and check. Bet, raise, re-raise, call. So uh, if, if the cap is k bets, there's always 2k plus 1 ways to get to the street. So there are nine possible actions in each betting round before the river. So there are three betting rounds, you know, pre-flop, flop, and turn. So let's use some symmetries because uh, I don't think the optimal strategy has you playing something differently with a6 of diamonds as a6 of hearts. In fact, it's very easy to prove that the optimal strategy <laughs> doesn't have that. So using symmetries on a flop, uh, so how many kind of distinct flops are there? Um, well, I kind of like to think about it as, uh, you know, where the suits have symmetries. I kind of like to think about it as, well, there can be three suits on a flop, two suits on a flop, or one suit. So if there's three suit, so if there's one suit on a flop, there's 13 three combinations of rank. That's pretty straightforward, right? If there's two suits on a flop, uh, uh, what what what's the combinations, right? There's 13 possibility for one of the suits, and there's 13 two possibilities for the other suit, right? It's like two spades and a heart, or something like that. The suits are symmetric. So there is 1,014 things with two suits. This is the majority of things. And if it's three suited, you just choose three ranks. And, but it's not 13 choose two, it's 15 choose two, because why? Because the ranks can be equal. So, like, uh, uh, so it would be 13 choose two if the ranks had to be unique, but you can have three aces on a flop. So this is actually 15 choose two. So there's 455 pre-suited flops, 1455 flops. That's kind of the big explosion in Limit Hold'em, right? Pre-flop to flop. Okay. Uh, so there's nine possible actions in each betting round. So let's count the number of turns and rivers. There's 49 turns and 48 rivers. So counting that, you have billion possible action sequences to the river. The 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 nine things in each street. The, uh, all the flops, and then it turns in rivers. So, okay. But each river, there could be up to 126 hand types, right? There's 47 times 46, uh, making about 6.5 trillion hand river types. Each node should be visited about 1,000 times. It's a big computational problem, but it's still tractable, especially if you have 900 years of CPU time. <laughs> Right, so, uh, and they, they also use many shortcuts. They use all the symmetries I talk about, and they also have a few sort of shortcuts. And you can see these trees are big, right? Terabytes of memory to actually store your strategy. So 
Uh, you can't really fit that on a node yet. I don't, I don't know. Can you fit that on a node now? Does anybody know? I don't know of, of, of a CPU that has like bytes of RAM yet. But uh, you, you can, it, what they did was they broke the problem up into about 100,000 different sub-games and they just kind of worked on those sub-games. In fact, I guess if you're clever about it, you know, you can use cache memory when you, you get down to the river, you know, things are, are pretty close. And you know that using cache memory is faster than using memory. You can take advantage of these things. Uh, a lot of these kind of updates or these regrets are just simple additions. And you can just optimize the, the, the heck out of this. And I'm sure they did it. Let's. So let's try to solve some other games. Um, I have kind of two games that seem sort of accessible. Suppose we do Omaha 8. Um, well, this is exactly the same structure as Limit Hold'em. You just change the, 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 change the hold cards. So instead of having like 47 choose two different um, uh, river hands, you have 47 choose four. That's like a multiple of 82.5x uh, to the original tree. Um, so that's not that bad, right? 900 CPU hours, this is just 75,000 CPU hours, right? If it were uh, 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 a, a matter of national security to get the exact solution to Omaha, the military could just do it in a few months, right? There's also bucking you can do, by the way. Basically, what they did is uh, before they did this was that they solved the sub game uh, in that uh, basically if you bucket hands together and you say you have to play these hands the same way that's uh, basically um, sort of uh, a sub strategy uh, you can consider sub space of your strategy x prime of x and y prime of y and you just solve the x prime y prime game uh, meaning you, you bucket hands together, probably on the river, because that's when bucketing kind of becomes more necessary. And you solve that game, and you go, well, how, how optimal is X prime uh, in the whole game? And you know, if you're good at bucketing, um, it may be pretty close. If you're bad at bucketing, like you put the aces in the same bucket as like 7-5 suited, you know, you probably won't get a great answer. So uh, you, you need to sort of diligently design you, your buckets. It's not, you can't, well, I, I guess there are also evolutionary things you can do to try to d design buckets and see what things are close to each other. But, uh, you know, people who have familiarity with this know that, you know, this, this, this is kind of hit or miss. Another game uh, that you can, uh, maybe solve is RAS. It's a, definitely the simplest variant of stud. Why is RAS simpler than all other games of stud? There are only 13 different cards, right? The deuce of spades is the same card as the deuce of hearts. You can't, well, you can make flushes, but they're, they're like irrelevant. So unfortunately, there are 13 to the eighth power possible ways up cards can come, right? Because there are four up cards, right? That, 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 and that's sort of the problem. <coughs> kind of the community information you have is sort of a bigger set and your trees just get bigger because um, now you have one extra street. Um, and you still have 415 choose three, you know, combinations of any three ranks as river hand types. So there are 2.4 quadrillion uh, river hands. So that's a factor of 374 over them. Um, but we think some of these like, uh, Roads are pretty null. Like, how many of you pl actually play Raz? Uh, a couple of you. Okay, great. Good poker class that people they study Raz. Like, if you have a queen up and the deuce completes it, you're not really going to get into a raising war and like make it the four cap on uh, third on third street. Some of the roads may be null. You can do some bucketing, perhaps. Uh, RAS is kind of uh, more natural to bucketing because uh, 
you know, you can kind of think about what hands to sort of bucket together. Maybe the king eight six deuce is very close to king eight six ace, and the two strategies, and 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 you can sort of start to bucket hands by kind of rank order of up cards or something like that. So, ah, you know, this is three seventy four. This is eighty two point five, or you you could uh, apply for a grant. And say we need X hours of CPU time. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what the right strategy is, but uh, these two problems are kind of tractable. Let's talk about big bet games because there's been some sort of discussion e even last night about um, what was I going to say about Snowy. Uh, a few people have tried big bet games. There are problems. First of all, there's a continuum of bets sizes you, you can make. The snowy solution just assumes like three bet sizes. I can bet half the pot, I can bet the pot, or I can jam, I think. Maybe there's like, yeah, I can bet two times the pot. But the problem with that is that I think that's a little bit too coarse. The question is, if you solve that game, how close is that solution to like the real game? And that's kind of an interesting question, but you don't even have a complete strategy. Like, what if, <laughs> what, what, what if some guy bets like a quarter of the pot, or 1.5 times the pot, so something that's not on your list? You have to kind of extrapolate, uh, and then it gets kind of weird because, like, okay, my response to a pot size bet is to raise a pot again. All right? What if he makes a 1.1 times the pot? Is is it right to raise a pot, just raise a pot, pot 1.1 times, or raise a pot like 0 0.9 times, so you get back to the same stack size, so, so, so you can do the same thing in the future. Uh, these are difficult questions. Uh, so even, uh, 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 even if some bet sizes are non-optimal, our full strategy needs responses to the bet. Uh, so simple approximations may work. I, I kind of feel this, this is kind of a tough problem, though. I mean, and uh, you, you can just, I mean, you're just playing the game where you can just make sort of rigid pot bet sizes, then you, you might get something actually interesting. So but one of the things with regret matching, if you actually have a lot of bet sizes, suppose you, you say, okay, I'm just to kill this problem, and I'm going to do like uh, 0.01 times a pot, 0.02 times a pot, 0.03 times a pot, and so on and so forth. The problem is now you have a lot of options which are really close in equity together. So this regret minimization is going to take a while, right? He's going to have to sort out really close like events. So, and then it's going to have to kind of balance your value bets with your blood and things like that. So e even just trying to kill it by putting a lot of bet types may not um, sort of solve the problem for you. Uh, so multiplayer three player games are actually kind of interesting. Um, they're, they're, they're addressed by the group and using counterfactual regret to create competitive multiplayer agents. And this was a paper done in like 2011 or so. Uh, and, and the programs were actually first and second in the annual three-player limit event. The, 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 the first problem is that there's no guarantee of epsilon convergence. You, you know, you're not necessarily within epsilon of a Nash equilibrium. Second problem is that um, do you just want to play in Nash equilibrium? There could be multiple Nash equilibria in multi-way games, especially in like these proportional payout tournaments, satellites, uh, where say two people get a seat, right? There are really nonlinear effects going, and it could just be which collusive equilibria are you playing? Um, and in the in 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 our book, uh, you know, Jared and I point out a game called the Rock Maniac game, where it's a real poker game where players can use a simple strategy and ensure uh, you losing. Uh, a simple version, a simple non-poker version, like kind of the game where you play even or odds with three players, but 
the, the odd man out wins. So suppose you and I are colluding against a third sort of chump. What would we do? Right, I would play one and you'd play two. And the third guy can never win. Right? There, there, there are situations which can come up in poker like that. So, but, you know, I think if there's like no kind of collusion uh, playing Nash Equilibria, and, and, and it's not a tournament, playing Nash Equilibria usually turns out okay. I think that's sort of the argument they were making and in creating strategies. All right, so here are the references. Um, all right, this took like about the time I estimated. So, uh, questions? Uh, how are we going to do it? Okay, let's just put your hand up first. Um, so, the original uh, strategy finds the, the Nash equilibria if you're playing against someone else who's uh, trying to beat the strategy, right? Um, is it that, does it work if one of the strategies is probabilistic? Let's say two strategies, yeah, yeah, yeah. It does work with mix. Right, but you don't know always which one I'll choose. Yeah, it, it works because uh, you're going to play uh, uh, the, all of these strategies assume that they could be mixed strategies. Like you can play, like if you're not allowed to play one third rock, one third paper, one third scissors, then you're going to have to play a really bad strategy. And there's definitely times in which mixing is going to be necessary. So yeah, all, all of these strategies have mixing. Uh, yeah. What effects do you think which is going to have on um, on the when Holden wins? Uh, I don't know. I think pretty much before uh, the solution came out, the big <coughs> online players kind of knew that a lot of people were playing near optimal, and I think the, the game is kind of dead. What do you think, Mike? Sorry for a long time. Right. So, yeah. Well, too bad Matt didn't, doesn't good come here. Are already basically doing this anyway. Well, no. I mean, even if you have the strategy, you kind of have to learn it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, or have some... T or, but the, the, the problem is that if you go to a casino and you play somebody who's, like, uh, a good limit hold'em player, he's... Because these types of strategies have been out for a while, they, 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 they already play much closer to optimal than they did before. So I think this would have absolutely no effect on, like, uh, heads up limit hold'em. It's already kind of, like, known. Yes? So can you talk more about, like, different ways you can do optimal things? So like you mentioned earlier, like, bucketing all of the an endless sort of list of kind of be clever in bucketing. So <coughs> you bucket hand types together. Uh, one kind of clever thing you can do is try to cut out the river entirely by just estimating like your equity on the river. You know, of course that's not going to be your showdown equity because you may be caught, forced to face a bet. Like it, uh, so you, you try some sort of implied uh, uh, value of your hand. Uh, you know, um, let's see, what other bucketing things? Uh, well, I mean, in some games, there's a sort of a natural way of kind of bucketing uh, hand types. Like in, in, in the river on, in Omaha, uh, you could just try to bucket the, the cards that actually play, right, and ignore the other cards. The thing is that when you do things like that, what you're losing is this thing we call card removal. Card removal and kind of blocking players from having the nuts and things like that are pretty important, uh, do turn out to be a pretty important part of um, the, the Game 3 Optimal Solution when you're getting down to the milli big block kind of level. And, you know, if you don't think about card removal at all, uh, then you, you actually have a strategy 
<coughs> that can be exploited pretty easily. Actually, I talked about this yesterday. Um, the, 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 the thing is that, you know, typically when the pot is P uh, and you're facing a bet, you, you want to make him indifferent to bluffing, right? He's betting one to win P. So you, you want to call about P over P plus one at the time, right? If you don't call this much, he, he's just going to bluff and take it, right? So that's, that's sort of the thing. Uh, we're saying the bet is one and pot is P. Uh, so if the pot is 10 and he bets one and he takes it more than one eleventh at a time, he's going to just, he can just profit bluff everything, right? Um, the real problem becomes that if you don't think about card removal at all, uh, he can start bluffing hands in which he knows it's more likely you have a mediocre hand or uh, something that excludes a strong hand. One, one real example is in PLO when there is a flush on the board, uh, what's a good bluff? Right, you have the ace of the suit, you don't have anything else. That's a great bluff because you're blocking him from having a great hand and uh, you, you know, you're blocking all of his nut hands and a lot of his really good hands and uh, he's much more likely to fold, right? Because a lot, if, 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 if you bet the pot, a lot of his hands he's sort of protecting himself with uh, are hands with the nut flush. Oh, I have a natural call. Do you call in? I have the nuts? Okay, I call, you know. So that's why card removal is... Uh, Sort of is, is important. Yeah. Uh, so is my understanding correct that off the wall kind of situation that is like Yes. And um, is there a difference between just like starting with some like off the wall situation that like creating like experience of the Oh, sort of like utility theory. Um yeah, in, in poker in general, uh, it, it's kind of weird. Um, people think a lot about that, what tournaments they should enter, what games they should play. But there hasn't been a study of really kind of optimizing your own personal utility within the games. The assumption is kind of like, well, I'm going to use all this cool utility theory stuff to figure out what game I'm well, once I'm playing the game, I'm just going to try to win the most money. <laughs> now, that's, that's sort of been the attitude. And I think that's actually correct for most. Uh, in limit hold, I mean, you need bankrolls of like hundreds of bets. You're not going to try to optimize and try to win some fraction of a bet uh, with, with your kind of utility function right? by lowering the variance. I mean... Um, uh, that is an interesting question because maybe, I mean, I feel that if, if there is some sort of utility consideration, like maybe in a tournament you feel your chips are nonlinear, uh, maybe you are going to quit playing your marginal hands because of utility considerations. Well, I mean, if you use ICM, <laughs> those utilities are, are already kind of calculated. But yeah, yeah, like for example, final table, the main event, I'm not only using ICM, but I'm thinking, well, <laughs> 3 million, uh, like, you know, 4 million compared to 2 million is, is a much smaller step to me than 2 million is compared to zero. Right. In my own, my own personal utility, or like, uh, like, like, 0.5 million compared to two million versus two million compared to 3.5 million. So uh, I need to optimize that utility. Um, uh, I mean, yeah, uh, I, I think that's kind of worthy of study. Yeah. Um, what is it about poker, um, analytics of poker, that makes it 
been so popular um, with trading firms? And how does it... Oh, okay, that's a great question. <laughs> Well, I mean, I think poker is just kind of, if you think, what one game, uh, if, you, if you could teach traders like kind of one game, what one game would sort of represent uh, what, what traders have to know? Well, you know, poker, there are a lot of actors, there's incomplete information, right? That's one big thing. Uh, and you do have to do a lot of thinking of what your counterparty is doing, right? If, if he wants to trade against you, he puts a bid or offer, you, you know, uh, some, some of that is why you kind of, why there's this offer out there. Is he trying to get out of risk? Does he have a big position he's trying to get out of? Or uh, do you have to be kind of worried about these orders and things like that? And also poker gives you the uh, sort of the skills to trade that, um, suppose you know something's worth 10 bucks, right? What mark are you going to make around it? Well, knowing nothing, you might make a uh, bid 990, offer at 1010, which means you're willing to buy it at 990 or sell it at 1010. But you may know something about the counterparty, right? You may know the uh, counterparty is going to be a better buyer than seller, or uh, you know that buying is the risky part or selling is the risky part. You know, that, that, that kind of as a quant, also as a quant, you know, doing poker analytics is very similar to, do, to the analysis we do in trading. You know, a lot of this analysis, how these strategies work, the, do these re strategies really return what we think they return, um, are, are similar to discussions we have in our trading strategy. I'm glad I'm able to talk to you about this because if you're interested in doing like poker strategies, you'll probably be interested in doing trading strategies too. Uh, any more questions? Yes. What about uh, deviation from possible strategies? Uh, the idea of detecting deviations or detecting, let's say, somebody goes from playing optimal to suddenly not playing optimal to tilt the agency. That's. Yeah, I mean, that's a very interesting thing. And that's actually hard to determine because uh, that's, that's a, that feels a little bit harder than this because this is static. It's like I'm trying to figure out the optimal strategy and I just play this. And, you know, whatever money comes to me, comes to me, right? You open your arms, the money comes to you. Um, the other thing is, oh, well, he's playing badly, so I'm going to go there and take his but then, if, if, if I deviate from optimal, I'm also opening up myself to you know, being exploited. So that's kind of hard. That the, that's much more of a dynamic problem, right? Like, when does he go on tilt? How long is he on tilt? What evidence does he, do we have that, 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 that he's on tilt? Um, I know that you know, Sandholm Gilpin, the guys in CMU, uh, we're looking into some sort of like zero loss way to exploit your opponents because you just figure out when your opponents are playing uh, badly, how much they've given up in uh, playing suboptimally, and then you go to exploit, but you, op you, don't, you only open up yourself to say half the money he's given up or something like that, playing badly, and their metrics. So the, the, there, there, there's some sort of kind of gaming algorithm you can do to do that. But yeah, that's, that's definitely another field of study. There are a lot of sort of interesting fields uh, that, that can come out of poker research. All right, I guess that's